By the 1930s, control of all the original tube companies was taken over by the newly formed London Passenger Transport Board. Its role was to oversee the continued expansion of the underground. With the population of Greater London approaching 9 million, something had to be done to increase the flow of passengers through the system. It wasn't feasible to increase the tunnel size for wider trains, so in 1935 the cars were redesigned to accommodate more people. One of the major problems of all the pre-1935 trains built for London Underground was that you had the switch compartment behind the driver and that used up 15% of the available passenger space. By 1935 they had sufficient design progress to put most of the equipment below the floor. Motors were smaller, the compressors were smaller, all the power supply systems were smaller and they produced these prototype trains in 1935. Since its opening in 1863, the London Underground has played a vital role in the lives of Londoners. But it would be during the dark days of World War II that the Underground really shone through. In 1940, Germany unleashed a deadly bombing campaign on Britain, the Blitz. 79 tube stations were used as air raid shelters accommodating thousands of people every night. The 30,000 people who sleep every night in tube stations raise a good many problems. They get there early and so need something to eat long before bedtime. London Transport has established six depots where the food is received and prepared for dispatch to the station canteens. The trains carried the women of the underground catering service that provided refreshments for the thousands of Londoners who sheltered on the station platforms on countless nights during the war. The uh, London Underground had, had one of the most efficient catering establishments. In fact, there was a total of over 75 which the catering department looked after. And so they took on the job of uh, providing refreshment trains. Buns, chocolates, timetables. Now these refreshment trains ran roughly about twice a day, once late evening and once before the service started in the morning. Tons of food are consumed every night. To prepare and deliver it is the work of over a thousand people. As well as looking after the needs of the people sheltering in the tube, 17,000 women took on jobs in the underground. They created a thriving underground world, producing the weapons of war in the munitions and armaments factories beneath the city's streets. During the Second World War, large numbers of women came to be employed by the underground group, mostly in place of men, of course, who had gone off to fight in the armed forces. But they took on a variety of roles, not just working in stations, but also in engineering capacities, such as relaying track or working in the underground factories, building new railway stock and repairing trains. Millions of vital bomber, fighter and tank parts poured out from this underground arsenal to the Allied forces in all corners of the world. The underground was also important for the wartime Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. The deep tunnels beneath Down Street Station became the subterranean headquarters for the War Cabinet. This passageway would have been the way out of the station up until 1932, but it had a much more important role during the war years. The Railway Executive Committee used this area for their meeting room, and it's where some of Britain's most important decisions for rail movements, troop movements, during the war years were taken. But it also had another important use. Up until 1942, when the War Cabinet Rooms were completed, Winston Churchill came here and met with some of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and with the War Cabinet. Here at track level, the platform areas were converted for use as a telephone exchange, as kitchens, as bedrooms and offices. And what we're standing in was one of the dining rooms. There were two dining rooms here, and we can tell that this one was one of the executives' dining rooms. And that was because they had wallpaper on the walls and a bell push to summon the steward. That gives you an idea of what kind of noise must have been present while people were trying to work, eat and even sleep as trains were passing by the site not more than six feet away from where we're standing. 
between August 1940 and July 1941, nearly 40,000 high explosive bombs and millions of incendiaries fell on London. Thousands of underground carriages were damaged or destroyed. But worse than the damage to the rolling stock and infrastructure of the underground, several disasters befell the tube that affected all those people who used the tunnels and platforms as shelter. Probably one of the worst was at Bank Station, which is right in the heart of financial London, where a German bomb penetrated the ticket office roof and slid down the escalator shafts before exploding. And it took over 18 months to reconstruct the station from the devastation caused. 56 people were killed in this disaster. In 1940, South London's Balham Station was also destroyed by a German bomb which burst a water main, drowning 68 people who were sheltering there. One of the worst civilian disasters during the Second World War took place at a partially built underground station at Bethnal Green in East London. Um, following a false air raid warning, uh, a woman and child tripped halfway down the staircases and in the ensuing crush nearly 200 people were killed. This tragedy was so awful the British government kept the details secret for nearly two years. After the war, the underground required an enormous quantity of new rolling stock to replace the carriages and motor cars that had been destroyed. The new trains took to the tracks on the district line in 1953, just as the last of the wooden cars were scrapped from the system. They were inspired by wartime technology. Following the experience with aluminium aircraft construction, London Underground used that experience to develop a aluminium car body. Aluminium was a good material to use because it was 20% lighter than steel, it didn't rust, and you could also get away with not painting it. In fact, you could save two tonnes of paint per vehicle if you didn't paint it. So in 1953, they tried running an unpainted vehicle around the system, and it was soon accepted by the public. So from that day onwards, all London Underground trains were built of unpainted aluminium and only since the mid-1980s, when we were hit by the scourge of graffiti, uh, did London Underground start having to repaint vehicles. As the new aluminium trains came into service, London Transport ceased its steam passenger train operation. In 1961, after nearly a century, the steam locomotives found their way into museum collections and enthusiasts' clubs. For London Transport, the future lay in automatic trains, they began experimenting with them on the district line in 1962. On March the 7th, 1969, London Underground again took the lead in the world when Her Majesty the Queen officially opened the Victoria Line, the first fully automated railway in the world. It was a pioneer. And the way it worked basically was that the driver would close the doors at the station and press two start buttons and the train would accelerate and proceed to the next station, brake and stop in the right place without the driver touching any of the controls. Each section of line was divided up into blocks, a few hundred metres long, and each block had a signal protecting it, on the basis that you never allowed more than one train into any one block at any one time. If you automate it, what you have to do is to tell the train whether the block ahead is safe to go into. And they do that by transmitting a code through the rails, through running rails, and this code is picked up by two receivers on the front of the train. And those receivers basically tell the train whether it's safe to go and at what speed. The Victoria Line, with its new age 67 stock, was the most modern urban railway in the world. The busiest section of the line, between Victoria Station and Buckingham Palace, carries 15,000 passengers during the rush hour. With the opening of the Victoria Line, automatic fare collection was introduced to make the underground more efficient. Passengers would purchase their tickets from machines instead of a ticket office. Their tickets were marked with a magnetically encoded strip that could be inserted into an unmanned barrier machine, giving them access to the platforms and the trains. This was an important time for the underground. After relying on the same equipment and stations for the last 50 years, they were in dire need of refurbishment. So in the early 1980s, many of the stations received a complete facelift. Expansions and renovations took place, which gave the central line a completely new look. The system runs daily, from 4.30 in the morning till midnight, when it shuts down for cleaning and daily maintenance. The staff who make this possible are rarely seen, 
They are the maintenance gangs who work at night when the track current is switched off. Some parts of the track are over 100 years old and require constant safety checks. Every bit of the line is walked every 48 hours to check for faults. But the age of the system was to be responsible for the London Underground's most recent tragedy. On Wednesday evening, November the 18th, 1987, a small fire started under an escalator at King's Cross. The fire spread very rapidly up the escalator and right across the ticket hall. It's believed to be started by a smoker dropping a match down the side of the treads on the escalator. It spread so rapidly that 31 people died in the fire, including an officer from the London Fire Brigade, and many more were seriously injured. London Underground itself did a great many changes immediately after King's Cross. There's a very strong no smoking policy within the whole of London Underground. After King's Cross, the Underground went through a period of safety improvement and modernisation. This improved Londoners' perception of the tube. It was also voted the third most impressive attraction in London by millions of visiting tourists. But for nine million Londoners, it is just a way of getting to work. The experience of the rush hour is never a pleasant one. During the morning and afternoon peak hours, 210,000 passengers pass through Oxford Circus and 240,000 use Victoria en route to and from work. For the 1990s, London Underground has introduced three new types of trains on three of the lines. 1992 on the Central Line, and 1995 on the Northern, 1996 on the Jubilee. Their traction system uses what we call electronic power. And the electronic power means that you can control the train with computers. The old direct current motors have been replaced by what we call alternating current motors. The reason for using these new motors is that they do not require the mechanical parts of the old DC motors, particularly brushes and the extra windings of the armature. This reduces the maintenance liability and improves the performance of the motors. And that's what's now standard on electric railways across the world. The Tube is a constantly expanding railway network. From its opening in 1979 by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, the Jubilee Line, the latest line in London, has developed into a modern, state-of-the-art railway. The Jubilee Line extension has taken 30,000 people six years to build. The additional 10 miles of tunnels cross the River Thames on four occasions, and 12 new stations are now in operation on what is one of the most high-tech and advanced underground railways in the world. Architects, Foster and Partners created the space-age look of Canary Wharf Station. With projects such as these, there really is a, uh, an interreaction between the architecture and the engineering of the stations. They're very complex uh, building projects. Canary Wharf was in a dock that had to be drained and then excavated still further, so uh, they're very much below water level. So if you imagine um, the building being effectively um, floating in water, um, held down to the, to the, um, the gravel levels below, um, every time you build another massive building next to it, it causes movement within the overall box. So the planning of that and the thinking of that um, from an architectural point of view and also from an engineering point of view were very complex. The Jubilee Line extension employs the latest technology to deliver an efficient and safe railway system. Safety is paramount and this totally new line can run 56 trains at any one time on the system. The trains are all new and are all controlled from their state-of-the-art nerve centre. Radio links enable the centre to be in contact with every driver and onboard information systems keeps passengers aware of changing travel details. In the future, London Underground will bring us bigger and fully automated trains. With nearly three million people using the tube every day, the system will need to be more efficient. I think Londoners want an underground system which enables them to travel to more places in more comfort. Tourists do seem to be to be markedly keener on the on the underground than the native Londoners, probably because they don't have to use it every day. I think more than anything, though, people want to be able to feel that they can sit in newer rolling stock, and I say sit rather than stand. They'd like a seat, so therefore they'd like more trains coming more quickly. 
I think most people think that London is one thing and the London Underground is another, but in fact the two things are intermingled. In a way, the Underground is London. It's the only thing holding London together. Plans now exist for passenger capacity to be increased by making better use of the available tunnel diameter, lowering the floor of the carriage and providing more gangway space for standing. This concept has been called Space Train, and gaps would be eliminated between cars by using short articulated segments to provide one continuous train instead of individual cars. It is hoped that the space train would transport 60,000 passengers per hour along the Victoria Line. The underground as we know it is just about full. There is no such thing as London without the tube. Of, of the one million people that came to work this morning, only 15% uh, came in cars, 85% uh, came by public transport, half of them used the underground for part or all of their journey. It was as the tube grew that London